Tonight, this special edition of online features the voice of one man. He is Tim Gallego, publisher and editor of the weekly newspaper, The Lakota Times. Brought up on the Pine Ridge Reservation in southwestern South Dakota, he remembers harsh early days that evoked fear and loneliness. Gallego's voice is somehow different from his printed words. Controversial, he is a man who stirs another. Tonight, February 27, 1990, online presents the voice of Tim Gallego. Rose and flows of angel hair And ice cream castles in the air And feather canyons everywhere I've looked at clouds that way but now they only block the sun They rain and they snow on everyone So many things I would have done But clouds got in my way I have tried my best to be very blunt in some of the editorials I write because I have found that if you don't cut right to the heart of the matter, if you're going to pussyfoot around and, and, and not go right down to the nitty-gritty that you're not going to really make an impression you're not going to really make people stop and think and so if sometimes I do things just to be a devil's advocate in our editorials and in, in, in my column because I've got to make people stop and say yes there is something wrong here there is something that we need to do to bring about change in this state and uh, it's it's hazardous sometimes you know I've, I've received some threats on my life but you know that's all you just let it wash off your back and you learn to be a little thick skinned because if you're going to do anything that's going to be in the public eye and be in television, I'm sure you've probably been the target of some of this, that you're going to attract those uh, angry people. But for every one that approaches you in, in anger or writes to you in anger, there's ten that are saying, keep up the good work. And so it's actually those, those people then that you, you really stretch yourself for, that you really put out more of an effort because you know when you get letters from people saying that I helped, you know, and, and uh, like this morning I got, we did a story two or three weeks ago on, on a very poor Indian mother living here in Rapid City and her daughter has a very uh, rare disease, elephantitis, and they're very poor, they're suffering, and we got a check in the mail sent to the Lakota Times for that girl for $150. So, you know, it's little things like that, they're, you know, in, in, in the long range of things, maybe they're not that important, but if it helps that family and, and we've reached someone who feels that they needed to reach out and help this Indian family, well, we've accomplished what we're trying to do. When I first started out uh, writing for the Rapid City Journal 11 years ago, I think I started out writing with a lot of anger inside of me and I've seen that anger at least channel so that I try to put it into a constructive uh, process now. and. Uh, I feel that over those 11 years, some of the columns I have written in, in trying to improve race, race relationships, I think have helped in South Dakota in, in, in sort of a intangible way, you know, you can't ever t really put your finger on it, but when you go somewhere, and I think probably at one time I may have felt that uh, there was so much bigotry and racism in South Dakota that it could never be uh, surmounted. But over the years, traveling across the state, speaking at different colleges and universities, and, and, and just uh, at different gatherings with a lot of non-Indian people, I've had so many of them come up and talk about the problems, wonder how they can be solved, and, and uh, so I think the uh, feelings that we need to do something in South Dakota are there, and it's just a question of the right people all getting together and doing something about it, you know, and I'd be very willing to go anywhere and talk anywhere and do anything I can. But I think I've got the suggestion out, I threw the ball to the governor, the governor grabbed the ball and he ran with it. And now I think it's up to the people of South Dakota to say, yeah, let's, let's all get together and get with our Indian neighbors or let's get with our white neighbors and let's sit down and talk about it. I mean, we've got the Black Hills problem. Uh, you know, the Lakota people are, are not going to give up the Black Hills. Uh, we're looking for an amicable settlement. We're looking for something where we know we can sit down as human beings, Indians and whites, and come up with a solution to it. I mean, there's so many things that we can do together positively, and uh, we're not doing it. 
Is there something, a time or a place or an incident that comes to you from your beginnings, your, something of your childhood and the way you grew up? Or our thoughts always drift back and our conversation always go back to that period in our lives you know, from first grade through whatever, you know, and uh, the years we spent within uh, this school, this Catholic Indian Mission. And uh, I think it colored and affected us so much, those years there, some good, some bad. And uh, it had a terrific impact on who we are and what eventually has happened to us in our lives. Can we talk a little bit about it? Is there a day or a time or something? Uh, it was a 24-hour experience. At Holy Rosary, uh, we did everything by the bell. We got up before the sun came up by the bell. We went to bed by the bell. We, we were really, uh, it was really a regimented, disciplined type of existence. We slept in dormitories. We had army bunks, uh, foot lockers. We marched to and from all our activities. We all wore the same kind of clothes. We had our heads shaved. And, I mean, it was really a, an institutionalized type of uh, upbringing. And I think probably from a lot of the, the, the children that went there, like myself from the community of Kyle where I was born, and a lot of the kids that came from Oglala and Wounded Knee and some of the outer line communities like Wam Lee, it was a, really a total cultural shock to go into uh, this type of an environment from the home environment that you were raised in. And uh, I think that's probably the first initial impact most of us had. It was just a, a fear and, and a loneliness that gripped you just as soon as your parents left. And you knew that you were there to fend for yourself from now on. And uh, at age five or six, like when most of us started there, it was, it was really a traumatic experience for all of us. What was the best thing that happened there? The friendships we made, a lot of us that uh, came from different parts of the reservation. Uh, we just all, we just formed a lot of friendships. We, of course, learned to play a lot of the games, the baseball, the football, and the soccer, and all the things that uh, took our minds away from the day-to-day -day activities there. And, and I think, in a way, the discipline and the work ethic that was instilled in us, uh, we went to school half a day, and, and we worked a half a day. That was, everybody had a job. Uh, some people, some kids worked in the carpenter shop, some worked in the, uh, blacksmith shop, others working in a dairy farm. The school at that time was almost totally self-supporting. Had, we had our own dairy herd, we had our own uh, poultry uh, farm, so everything, uh, we had our own farm, we grew our own potatoes, and, and, and uh, the kids were the, uh, the labor force. I mean, that half of our day was spent providing, and uh, my, my particular job when I was old enough to do it, stand, stand tall enough, was I was a school barber. And uh, I would start uh, cutting hair with the first grade students, and uh, when I and then I would go all the way through this to the seniors. And when I got done with them, it was time to start all over again with the first grade. You know, considering there was probably four or five hundred kids there at the time, so it was uh, a work ethic I think that uh, really prepared a lot of us to assume the responsibilities of holding jobs. How is it that you came to be a newspaper publisher? Do you want to talk about, for the, for the person out there, maybe the young Indian person mm -hmm. listening, uh, how did you get your start? Well, I think one of the first things a lot of the kids need nowadays, we need it very badly back then, when I was growing up, didn't have, was role models. You know, uh, when I grew up and, and uh, went to school at Holy Rosary, all of our teachers were either priests or nuns, and, and we didn't have uh, the Indian influence like you find on the reservation schools now. We have a lot of Indian teachers and Indian principals. and uh, So I think by finding someone that I could really look up to and really admire, and, and uh, the gentleman I, I learned to really care about was uh, he passed away just uh, two months ago, as a matter of fact. His name was Rupert Costo. And Rupert was a, a Kawea Indian from California, one of the last of his tribes, which at one time was one of the most populous tribes in California and had been reduced to just a handful at the time of his death. Um, Rupert was a very strong newspaper editor, very strong journalist. Uh, he he uh, assumed his role by copying a turn of the century Indian gentleman named Carlos Montezuma. And uh, Carlos uh, had the Indian name Wasaha, which means to send out signals in his language, Fort Apache. 
that's been my, my whole uh, reason for being involved in journalism, because I saw what an impact they had with their newspaper, and I, I saw that Rupert was able to sit down and really take the establishment by the nape of the neck and shake it. And I, I just admired that. And I, I know out here in South Dakota, we needed it so badly. You know, we have uh, all newspapers in the state, the 155 newspapers in the state. And uh, I doubt if uh, at any given time you could find two Indians working for any of the 150 newspapers here. I know the papers weren't really addressing issues important to us on the reservation for a lot of reasons. Logistics, you know, long ways to travel to the reservation lack of knowledge about tribal governments, uh, maybe not having that in with uh, the different people on the reservation that could uh, give you leads into stories. And uh, having uh, the background, having lived on the reservation, I knew that there were a lot of good, positive stories happening out there. And But when you picked up a lot of the local papers, you just read a lot of the stories about crimes being committed by Indians or, or, or a lot of the negatives. And uh, I really wanted to try to project a more positive image of the people that I grew up with on the reservation. How does the writing process work for you? When you sit down and you're going to write a column or you know begin to speak, how do you begin and how does the writing process work for you? Well, I guess uh, there was a columnist for the New York Times that said that uh, writing a weekly column is very easy. All you have to do is sit down at a typewriter and sweat blood. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, it, it, it's an opportunity because I've talked to so many people and uh, I've had so many phone calls and, and you know I've got more ideas for columns and, and I've been writing them now every single week going on 11 years I've written a column mm -hmm. weekly and uh, it, it's taken a lot of uh, stick to to do it you know a lot of determination and sometimes uh, a little callousness because you know the columns that uh, maybe might touch some soft spots, particularly when I write columns uh, about religion. Uh, it bothers some people and, and uh, they react very angrily and very violently to it. But uh, The ideas are there and uh, I, I think it's like painting a picture. I, I, I think it's an artistic endeavor, you know. I've learned, I think, or maybe I was born with a gift to paint with words. And that's the way I look at it. I, I look at my columns as, as something that is artistic. Some people may not, but <laughs> I look at it that way. There's a saying that I know hangs on a lot of Indian homes, I know you know too, that says, Great Spirit, uh, please grant that I may not criticize my neighbor until I've walked a mile in his moccasins. How do you come to terms with that philosophy and way of living? thinking in light of your work. Is that hard or how does that work for you? Or what do you think about the saying? You know, in the newspaper business, I don't know. I think uh, it's an educational process because uh, on most reservations, the newspapers are owned by the tribal government and are really propaganda tools of the tribal government. There's only one independent Indian-owned weekly newspaper in the United States. That's the Lakota Times. We're it. There are one or two other independent papers, but they're like maybe uh, twice a month or maybe monthly. We're the only independent weekly in the United States that's Indian owned. We're the largest newspaper in the state of South Dakota. Bar none, we're the largest weekly in this state. We've done it all in nine years. Uh, we have to do news stories that are not favorable because we're a paper. We report the news. We're like any community newspaper. And our, our, our readership is primarily reservation. I don't think that the stories we do can be called stories that are critical or, or criticize individuals. We try to do a balanced story because if that individual we're doing a story about has had something occur, occur to him or her that uh, they might find you know, repugnant, at least we give them an opportunity to try to respond to it rather than have it a one-sided thing where they don't get to tell their their version of it, their side of it. So it's taken us a while, you know, we're, we're, we're new, we're only nine years old, we're just starting our 10th year. And like any new business, any new venture, uh, and getting involved in something that was totally alien to us, it, it's, it's, a, it's a learning experience. Sure, I mean, we've made mistakes. We've made some very stupid mistakes, but uh, We've learned by them, 
And I think one of the things we have really striven for is objectivity. We've tried to be a, a paper that gives a balanced view of things. If we're going to report on something, I want to hear both sides of the stories, and I stress that with my reporters. Get out and get the story, but I want both sides of the story. And uh, I'm, I'm going to fight for that. So it, it's, uh, it's hard because I'm trying to educate a tribal government. I'm trying to educate a lot of the Indian people into freedom of the press, what it's all about. I mean, they can't expect to pick up a phone and call me and, and say, well, so-and-so did this and that. And, and uh, you know, they expect me to take a story that's based on gossip and put it in the paper, even though they may feel very strongly about it, because I've got to have facts. I've got to have substantiation before I do a story. And I get people angry at me sometimes because they would like to throw a story to me. They would like to remain, remain totally anonymous. And uh, anonymity is good in some cases. And, and, and you know, if a person's going to risk losing their job if they came up and talk, you know, if they're working for an agency or a tribe and they know that it's going to cost them their job, and then we'll, we'll do a, as a news source rather than give their name. But for the most part, it, it's an educational process because you have people on reservations that have never had a newspaper that had the freedom to allow them to express themselves. So it, it's a challenge. Your work is to speak. Is there ever a time that you just want to be quiet and not speak? Well, every day. I, uh, I've reached the point where when I see those reporters from what I call the Eastern reporters walk into this office and I know they're going out to the reservations to do some stories. I get very apprehensive and I'd rather not even talk to them because I know no matter what I do, no matter what I say, they're going to go out be and do the terrible stories that they always do on reservations simply because that's why they came out here. They didn't come out here to get advice, they didn't come out here to visit, a, to visit with me and, and ask me to give them some good leads. They came out here with a, an idea of how their story was going to turn out before they ever sat down and, and wrote it. Is there a story mm -hmm. uh, or a time or experience that you can recall that you would like to share? Yeah, you know what, uh, I think uh, something Jim I'd really like to talk about is we always look at prejudice coming from prejudice of white against Indian. and. You know, I was born on the Pioneer Reservation, and I went to school down there, and I've traveled across the world and the country since that time. And I see a lot of prejudice within our own people. I see uh, a prejudice in my earlier years of uh, mixed blood against full blood, or the reverse, full blood against mixed blood. I see a, a prejudice back in the turbulent 70s and, and 60s of Indians against white. Um, so we have our own little prejudices within our own race. And I guess a good example of that would be that, uh, you know, people like myself who are a mixture of Indian, my great-grandfather came up here in the 1860s. There was two brothers named Gallego that were Tiwa Indians from the San Juan Pueblo. And in the 1860s, when cattle w was driven through Texas, up through New Mexico and Colorado, up to what they call the Indian agencies, they'd pick up a lot of drovers on the way. And when they were coming through northern New Mexico through the San Juan uh, Pueblos, they picked up two brothers, Rafael and Jesus Gallego. They picked up families like Mendoza's, Hernandez, Garcia's, that were had Spanish surnames because the Pueblos of New Mexico were occupied 200 years before the whites ever reached here by the Spaniards. And there's a lot of us now, there's a lot of Gallegos, there's a lot of Gallegos, there's a lot of the Mendozas, there's a lot of Hernandezes who are a portion Tiwa and a good portion Sioux because this is where our ancestors, we were a portion of the both. And yet I find that uh, an example, uh, one lady was highly critical of something that occurred in, in, that was published in my newspaper, the Lakota Times. And in her anger she said, well, they ought to change the name of that newspaper to the Mexican Times. I mean, so we have our own prejudices, you know. I mean, we're prejudiced against the, the Hispanics, we're prejudiced against black, we're prejudiced against whites, we're prejudiced against mixed bloods, against full bloods. I mean, we have our own prejudices within our own culture that we need to really start working on. And I think before we can st stand back and not point the finger at somebody else for being prejudiced, we've got to clean up our own house, too. 
Let's talk a little bit about South Dakota. I think still the state has to start looking at their dealing with Indian tribes as governments. They can't start looking at states anymore, uh, at reservations anymore, and, and, and uh, thinking that eventually that parcel of land is going to be a part of the state because it's never going to be. It's always going to be an independent, sovereign nation. And it, it's, uh, it's going to require some really, really tough rethinking on the part of the state legislators, and as a matter of fact, on the, the part of the people of South Dakota to start looking at Indian nations as nations that is going to come, it's going to have to come. Are tribes ready to be sovereign nations to directly channel funds that come from Washington? I think some are and some aren't. And uh, I've always looked at our, our system of government on the reservations as sort of microcosms of, of the larger government and, and along with what we've learned from our tribal constitutions and uh, as compared to our traditional forms of government. You know, we also have uh, picked up a lot of the, the bad that you'd find in any government. We do have some forms of corruption. We do have uh, professional politicians who are more interested in lining their own pockets than in, in assisting the people. And I, I think that the fact that there's a radio station uh, like on Pine Ridge Reservation and, and there's communications uh, breaking out on a lot of the reservations and, and newspapers that are holding the tribal administrations more to accountability and I think I'm seeing some changes. I see a lot of young people now who are coming along and wanting to get into tribal government who are honest, who are uh, determined to uh, use their power when they do get into office to get out and help those people that really deserve it. When I think of the environment and issues that South Dakota is dealing with, I think of the uh, waste dump uh, near Edgemont, the mining that's taking place in the Northern Hills, and the statewide issue of water quality. What's your thinking on any or all of those? Uh, when you get into mining or, or into uh, uh, dump sites, Again, what I have found is the state is ready to move in a certain direction, maybe even grant a license for someone to have a dump site, say at Edgemont, without ever really considering that uh, if there is going to be any contamination in, in the water tables underneath the dump site, say it's, it's hazardous waste material and nuclear waste, they don't look at where that water eventually is going to end up. And a lot of that will end up on the reservations. It's in the Madison Aquifer or the Oglala Aquifer. That water contamination will eventually end up on, on Pine Ridge or other reservations. And what I'm seeing is th the state isn't recognizing the fact that those people that are going to be impacted by it, those tribal governments, should be invited to sit down at the table when these discussions are taking place and have an input into it because they're going to be affected by it also. And uh, I see that happening in almost every area in the state where we're doing something to damage our environment. The tribes aren't being considered as equal partners in helping to find solutions to it. If you were governor of South Dakota, uh, what's the first thing you would do? If I, as Tim Gallego right now, were the governor of South Dakota, I think one of the first things I would do is I would actually call a summit meeting between the state legislator and the chairman of every tribe in the state of South Dakota. And if it took three, four days to sit down and talk about the things that we need to do to address our problems on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. I think you are one man, you know, who makes a difference. How can one person make a difference in South Dakota between Indian and non-Indian people now? I think once you get an idea going, I think everything springs from ideas. And once an idea can take root and grow, an, an idea of a reconciliation, um, and I, I guess I'm very disappointed in my colleagues in the media in South Dakota, with the, probably the exception of South Dakota Public Television, who I think aired the entire speech of Governor Mickelson when he talked about reconciliation 
on the, on the opening day of the legislature. I'm very disappointed in the fact that Governor Mickelson has publicly proclaimed to make 1990 a year of reconciliation. And I think the significance of 1990 probably escaped a lot of them, but it's the 100th anniversary of Wounded Knee, of the massacre at Wounded Knee, and it's a very sacred year for the Indian people. Any last word or message you want to say to the people of South Dakota? I think if the people of South Dakota could start looking at the Indian people as their neighbors, as their friends, and say that, uh, you know, there's no saying that uh, if you care about someone, take them out to dinner, you know, and, and I, I don't, I'd like to see that happening in South Dakota. Uh, I'd like to see the non-Indian people of South Dakota feel that they can become friends with the Indian people because I think it could be mutual. I think the Indian people would reach out. Rose and flows of angel hair And ice cream castles in the air And feather canyons everywhere I've looked at clouds that way but now they only block the sun They rain and they snow on everyone So many things I would have done But clouds got in my way Next week at this time, join us for Festival featuring the Limelighters and Joan Baez live in concert. That's next week at this time. Online will return March 20th, 1990. This concludes our special series featuring the voice of the individual. If you would like to express your views about our program, call our online number at 605-697-5000 or write us a note to online, South Dakota Public Television, Pugsley Center, Brookings, South Dakota, 57007. Tell us what you're thinking, South Dakota. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Fairy tale comes real. I looked at love that way once upon a time. But now it's just another show. You leave them laughing when you go. And if you.